The order came from the hillside residence that dominates all of Malaya. Here with his family lives Malaya's High Commissioner. General Sir Gerald Templer inherited an almost hopeless task. Malaya, terrorized and demoralized, seemed likely to fall under communist domination. But he quickly reorganized the campaign against communist infiltration with vigor and imagination. For the march of time, General Templer gives his view of Malaya's situation. You've asked me to say something of our aims in Malaya today. Just as in Korea and in Indochina, the menace of communism has manifested itself in armed aggression and has attempted, unsuccessfully, to throttle the economy of the country. It's failed abysmally because of the loyalty of the vast majority of technicians and laborers of the essential services and industries. The shooting isn't over yet, by any means. But daily, more and more people are becoming less frightened to support the government. We're trying, therefore, to turn our attention more and more to the social services, to education, and to the political development to which the people are entitled. On this structure, we are trying to build the foundation of a sound local administration which will be the basis of a united and self-governing Malayan nation. The success of General Templer's administration is due in part to his frequent whirlwind trips to Malaya's backcountry. Jungle villages and settlements, isolated from Kuala Lumpur and especially vulnerable to communist raids, have become accustomed to seeing General Templer descend on them via his helicopter, encouraging or scolding them depending on their attitude toward the government's emergency measures. Today, a March of Time camera crew accompanies General and Lady Templer on a trip to the semi-autonomous state of Tranganu in the northern part of Malaya. Using three American-made S-55 helicopters, General Templer and his party fly high over the jungles. In the village of Chukai, Templar inspects an honor guard of the King's African Rifles. Recruited in Africa, these troops have proven themselves many times in the bitter jungle fighting. On the trip, Sir Gerald drops in unexpectedly at the schoolhouse of a small village. This member of the local kindergarten set is called on for a hasty recitation of his lesson. In the settlement of Kuala Brang, General Templer reviews the Home Guard, a volunteer force which protects the village against communist guerrilla attacks. Here, Templar's instructions to the local police are, see to it that no food gets to the bandits. Absolutely no food must reach them. Under Templar's supervision, the half million Chinese squatters who live on the fringes of Malaya's jungles are today being moved to newly created villages where the loyal Chinese are protected from the bandits. This tremendous resettlement project has been mainly responsible for the failure of communist terrorism. The jungle grows no food, and without these squatters to prey on, an increasing number of bandits have been forced to give themselves up to government forces. in which this family will make its new home is closely guarded. The new villages to which these Chinese squatters are moving are often close to their former jungle homes. These new communities, with their superior educational and welfare facilities, 
may in the long run develop these Chinese from isolated jungle squatters into responsible Malayan citizens. In the new village of Batu Lima, the Templars see for themselves how quickly these squatters have adjusted to their new surroundings. During the past 18 months, Templar has made 50 trips like this one into Malaya's interior, an area seldom visited by former High Commissioners. General Sir Gerald Templar is the man primarily responsible for winning the war against a seldom-seen enemy who terrorized this rich Asian country. A forceful and inspiring leader, he has won the admiration and confidence of Malaya's many races and the respect of those who serve under him. One of Malaya's greatest assets and a primary target for jungle raiders is the Federation's tin mining industry. In the early morning hours, engineers Caldwell and Little Dyke arrive at the isolated Killing Hall tin mines at Puchang. This dredge, one of the most productive in Malaya, floats on a pond which it digs as its buckets bite deep into the Malayan soil. This giant dredge moves slowly through the jungles, leaving behind it a deep swamp. The dredge's continuous chain of buckets scoops up the mineral-bearing soil and dumps it eventually into a large sieve. Here, streams of water wash the soil away, leaving the mineral deposits. Today, Malaya is the world's foremost producer of tin, but installations such as this must be guarded at all times. Each week, the payroll for the tin mine's personnel is brought in by a de Havilland tiger moth. Cecil Kitzel, the manager of the tin mine, waits with his dogs to retrieve the payroll as it is dropped from the plane. The Spaniels are loyal Malayans. So far, neither dog has ever turned the money over to the communists. March of Time director Godwin chats with Mrs. Kitzel, the manager's wife, in her pleasant bungalow near the tin mine. Despite ever-present danger from prowling bandits, the Kitsells spent all five years of the real emergency in their jungle home, with their guns handy day and night. Manager Kitsells' production problems are complex. Well, Mr. Kitsell, during the uh, very height of the emergency, did you find that tin production suffered? No, it, uh, production was maintained uh, throughout the emergency, and I think that... Uh, during the emergency, it increased uh, slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had to continue, uh, although things are considerably better now, we've had to continue uh, a number of the emergency precautions. Mm -hmm. uh, we still operate 13-hour night shifts on the bridge. Oh, the yeah. whole crew, that is, they have to go on at 6 in the evening and come off at 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. To Malaya's civilians like Cecil Kitzel, the emergency has eased somewhat. <laughs>